Good afternoon, everyone. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, and I am Caroline Bailey, a Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the third session of our LTSS Maryland Lunch and Learn series. Today's session is called Addressing the Elephant in the Room, What It Takes for Successful IT Integration and Staff Training. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webinar, by computer and by phone. If you're having trouble hearing, you can try switching your audio by selecting the other audio option on the webinar panel. There is one handout for this webinar, which can be found in the handout section of your control panel. And we will be taking breaks to answer questions throughout the presentation. So please enter any questions you may have into the question box on your webinar panel. The presentation will be recorded and will be available on BDA's LDSS Maryland webpage. Now I'd like to turn it over to Leslie Stuziak. Thanks, Caroline. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Caroline said, my name is Leslie Stuziak. I'm the statewide director for provider services with DDA. Um, and I want to welcome you all to our third session in our Lunch and Learn series, um, all related to a successful transition into LTSS Maryland DDA module. Um, we're very excited today to have um, two providers with us to share their um, experience, the what worked, what didn't work, lessons learned, um, all of that good stuff. Um, we have Matt Morgan, who is the Chief Program Officer with the Arc Central Chesapeake region. Um, he's been with the Arc Central Chesapeake for uh, four years and has been um, a, a, a major part of their transition. Um, they transitioned into LTSS on April 1st. They went live with all of their services. And then we also have Paul Anderson, who is the Program Director for Abilities Networks Community and Employment um, Partners Program. Um, and so he oversees the services provided on the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland. Um, and he has also been a huge part of, of Abilities Network's um, go live process. And they were part of the early adopter group that went live um, last, last year in October. Um, so he has a great deal of, of knowledge to share with us, us as well. So I will turn it over to Matt. All right, thank you, Leslie. Um, uh, at first, first I want to just uh, start off with uh, uh, asking people to, uh, encouraging people to put questions into the question box. Uh, we want this to be uh, as much of a conversation as possible. Uh, you know, I know that's a little tough given this medium um, and that we can't see each other's questions and everything, but the questions uh, help give us a sense of sort of where everyone is at in their own transition process and um, what some of the sort of major areas of concern are. So hopefully we can you know, tailor some of our answers to that and then also just give DDA a better sense of, uh, you know, for potential topics for the future, just uh, what providers are looking for in terms of information. So. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, there's no magic solution to any of this. I know sometimes uh, I'll get calls from other providers or I'll call other providers because someone will hear of a great idea and think that you know, maybe someone has found the answer uh, and that's sort of never the case. Um, I've disappointed a number of people I know. Um, so I just, uh, just can't stress enough that there's no piece of software uh, that's going to replace the need to really dig in and understand uh, the services, particularly the newer services. Um, the rates, what's included in the rates, uh, and the billing guidelines surrounding that. So I just really want to encourage everyone to uh, to dig into that information if they haven't had a chance to already. Uh, Paul's going to talk a lot about the training aspect, but just wanted to reiterate that part um, and, and the need to train staff at all levels uh, in that information. I know one of our lessons learned has been uh, at times we've uh, done robust training for a group of staff and then sort of forgot about turnover and maybe a newer staff member will join the team and didn't get as much training and uh, it'll take us a month or two to realize, oh, right, we, uh, we need to get you up to speed on that. So uh, the training aspect is important. Um, so in terms of IT integration, um, just a few thoughts on sort of what you would be looking for uh, if you were gonna switch to a new IT vendor or look for greater in integration with LTSS. Um, Billing through LTSS itself uh, takes a lot of time. So, uh, and that, that means if you're actually entering the billing in the system itself. So, uh, probably takes a little bit longer than PCIS, um, but, but there's that level of tedium to it. Um, so, um, 
it's it's worth considering looking at a IT solution that uh, can integrate um, with LTSS and handle that billing process um, uh, quickly. Um, now, when I get to lessons learned, I'll talk a little bit about whether how quickly you want to do that. But um, but I think uh, that's one of those things where if you're if you're spending a lot of time training your staff, um, particularly DSPs and then managers, to enter information correctly uh, that would tie through to billing. Um, you don't also want to be spending a lot of time having your finance team or whoever does the billing um, also having to do a lot of essentially keystrokes and clicks um, to get that information into LTSS. So um, there's a number of software solutions that do that. I'm not you know, plugging anyone in particular, but that's just something that you might want to look for. Um, and as you're doing that, just verify that they do have true integration with LTSS. Um, again, they're the sort of the known vendors that do that, but um, uh, we've had experiences with software vendors, not any of the ones we currently work with or, or the sort of players in this area, but just in general that will oversell their products um, in terms of the ability to talk with other systems. And so it's important to verify that that really can happen um, prior to going further down the road with them. Um, when looking at software, it's also we found it's important to evaluate it from all levels of user experience. So it's very easy to uh, look at a solution from an administrative level and what that can bring to the administrative team or the finance team. But but really, how does that look for the end user who's going to be entering that uh, that data, uh, using that on a daily basis? Uh, for instance, uh, unrelated to LTSS, but with med administration, like. What is it, you know, a lot of software will say, well, we can track medication administration, but what does that really take for a user uh, who's doing that, you know, three or four times a day? Like, what are the steps in that? What does it look like for them? So you get a full picture of what that uh, solution's offering. Um, if you're looking at uh, tying LTSS to a software solution, uh, you also want to make sure it ties through the backup documentation, service notes, that kind of thing. Um, it's it's it would be preferable to have all of that located in, in sort of one one area and it, so it all ties through together so that uh, anyone who's approving that service could uh, have everything they need at their fingertips to to look at you know not just the specific services that were entered but what's the backup for that and, and does that uh, match the definitions and that kind of thing um, also ideally uh, in a in a it solution you'd have software that uh, services could be set up to match LTSS very closely. So as we all know, LTSS has monthly authorizations, as an example, for services. Um, you would want that monthly cap uh, you know, in, in that system, same as units. You know, Is it converting hours to units if that's appropriate for that service? So you really want it to, to mimic LTSS closely uh, so that less work has to be done on the, the billing side. Um, I'm sure, that, so this question always gets asked, I'm sure it's going to be asked, uh, we use iCare Manager, um, but I don't want to, uh, I'm not sort of plugging any particular software, um, and I don't want to get any angry emails from Arnie Dordick, just kidding. Um, so uh, I think that uh, there's, there's a number of vendors that um, can check these boxes, and so it's worth uh, having those conversations with them, and, and every provider is different, and every vendor offers a little bit different of a product, so it's really it's really worth having that conversation to get a good match between what a vendor has to offer and how each agency operates or how their services are structured. Um, so looking at some of the lessons that we've learned through this process, um, I think one of the key things that we did early and that worked out in the long run was sort of pushing back on DDA or just having a lot of conversation um, to make sure that our services are aligning in LTSS. Um, uh, with with what's being provided based on what the person wants. And um, and I know uh, Bianca in particular said, you know, she and I had a lot of conversations and, and she was like, I don't know why we're, you know, we're just going head to head all the time. And then sort of finally when we got ready to go live, it clicked and it was like, oh, thank, thank goodness we've been doing that because now everything's set up and ready to go. And it's also been a learning process for both sides of that. You know, we, we push back a little about what, is capable and the, the system's capable of what we're allowed to do as a provider um, and, and getting it set up in a way that works. And DEAs, you know, in turn, explored that on their end of what 
what they can authorize and that kind of thing. So it's been a important process, but it, it's it's and it's definitely improved our level of communication. We have a you know a good working relationship with um, the regional office around that. Um, another lesson is just the importance of collaboration across service departments to ensure clarity on who's entering attendance. Um, so good proactive communication. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, if, if when you're really talking about grading services in LTSS, um, you might be, uh, someone might be receiving day habilitation um, and they might also have job development and, you know, and that, that could occur sort of back to back. And so um, how is, how is that, uh, being, you know, how are those DSPs uh, interacting? For instance, the job developer might say, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with this person, do some job development right now. I'm gonna stop the attendance, you know, put an end time for dayhab, and then I'm gonna start uh, job development. And then when, you know, we're we're done with that, uh, and they return to dayhab, I'm gonna start that service again. So, so just having that good communication to make sure that there's not overlap of services, um, and that everyone's on the same page. Um, also, uh, technology, I think Paul's gonna talk about this as well, but just ensuring that um, aside from the, whatever software solutions being used that that uh, we found it helpful for staff to have um, the physical technology they need, in our case, it's iPads, um, so that they can enter attendance in real time or as close to real time as possible. Um, when you start, again, talking about grading services, you, it's really hard to uh, for staff to recall what happened, you know, either earlier that day, the next day, and certainly a week later. And so, having the technology available so that um, uh, that you know attendance is, you know, if it's a start and end time kind of thing, that that can be done in real time, so you're getting the most accurate data, and again, preventing those overlaps and that kind of thing. Um, so I talked a little about billing quickly. Um, I would say, I, I think we could probably bill our whole program in about a minute. I don't know that I would want to do that. Um, and I would say that uh, even though you could bill quickly, uh, it's important uh, that you have a process in place for the review of data, ideally by multiple people. Um, so you want to get different eyes on things, uh, not just the person entering it, but a manager, um, maybe someone in a different department, because everyone has a little bit different understanding of the services or um, has more knowledge of, of that person's service plan or what their day looks like and and a little bit different perspective and, and can catch things. And so it's important to really review that because um, it's it can be tempting to click the button and send everything at once, but you really want to um, massage things. And I think Abilities uh, Network has done a good job of, you know, Paul was talking about his system and he'll talk about that. And I think it's um, it's uh, it's important to develop those internal processes. Um, lastly, a, a question that also gets asked a lot um, around uh, the transition to LTSS is staff positions. I know a lot of providers want to prepare for, uh, you know, get their budgets in order and prepare for what's ahead. So um, we have, we've brought on both a PCP administrator and then we also have a systems administrator. Now uh, the PCP administrator handles obviously everything related to PCPs, reviewing, um, uh, ensuring that you're know, tracking them through the process, ensuring they're being completed in a timely manner. Um, and the systems administrator, administrator really focuses on the IT solution, training staff, um, working on any you know, issues with that system. And then again, making sure that those services are set up um, and that uh, people's individual services are authorized in alignment with LTSS. So, so our system closely matches what's approved in LTSS. So I'll pause now for questions. Um, I know that's a okay. sort of a scattershot information, but. Okay, Matt. Um, this is a question. We're in line to be an early adopter, and I was asked to do a cost analysis of PCIS2 billing versus what would be LTSS billing for our meaningful day program. With PCIS2, you currently have to have three hours to bill a full day. Is there a minimum to bill per day in LTSS? Does it matter if it's virtual versus in person? So I'll take a stab at that. And if 
anyone from DDA wants to jump in and correct anything. So there is no minimum um, to bill, uh, but but you know that particular service goes in 15 minute increments. You could only do 15 minutes in a day if you wanted to, but again, you would be only paid for one unit, um, the 15 minutes. So uh, so there's no minimum uh, to the service, but um, what was the second part of that? The other part was um, um, with PCIS2, you currently have to have three hours to bill a full day. Is there a minimum to bill per day in LTSS? And does it matter if it's virtual versus in person? I read the virtual part. Yeah, um, it does not matter um, from LTSS, but there are, so from that perspective, it doesn't matter in the system. Obviously, there are certain rules around doing virtual where that can't be the sole service the person receives. So you'd, you'd want to check the um, the other parts of the, the waiver that specify the rules around that. But but it doesn't matter to the system it's, if it's virtual or in person. Thanks, Matt. And this is Leslie. I you back off of what what Matt just said. If you know if you are you know, looking at using as a service delivery model, um, you you know, you want to make sure that your program service created to reflect that. Thanks, Leslie. There are no more questions at this time. So at this point, we're going to turn it over to Paul Anderson to speak about his experiences. All right. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you, Matt, for your sharing your wisdom with our, our group here today. Um, again, my name is Paul. I'm a program director with Abilities Network on the Eastern Shore. I'll get off of uh, Matt's question slide here and on to my presentation. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit um, today. Uh, I'll be sharing some of the considerations that Abilities Network gave um, and what we took into account when planning and implementing our transition to uh, the LTSS fee-for-service model. Um, as Leslie mentioned earlier, we went live in LTSS uh, October 1st of 2021. So um, we've been in there for a little while now, and it was a, a long road getting there, and we were eager to, to, to jump in and get started as we were working for a long time to kind of get things in place for that. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk, talk about, um, you know, I'm a program director, so I supervise our direct support staff, um, our community support professionals and community support managers who provide direct services and uh, support managers help to develop the, uh, the SIP and our DSAT for PCP documentation. So I can really kind of speak to things from a perspective of, of what IT related stuff we put in place, you know, what things related to our, our, our database um, that impacts uh, and relates to LTSS and, and the day-to-day -day operations of, of providing services and documenting those. So, I'm going to start with the PCP, the uh, the SIP uh, service implementation plan, and the DSAT, and then I'll move on. Um, I'll sh I'll share our service delivery documentation, um, like how we document our service delivery, the screen our staff use to um, put in uh, what they did with with people, and and uh, make sure we're meeting all of our requirements there. Uh, I'll touch on our documentation review and approval process, and our billing for services. Um, we do not use an automated billing uh, for LTSS. We are, are manually doing that, and I'll, I'll walk through briefly our process for doing that. And I'll also be touching on kind of our staff training considerations that uh, were involved with this whole process. Um, so again, starting with the uh, our uh, PCP documentation as a provider, you, you know, I think we're all aware that the providers are responsible for um, for developing the service implementation plan. Um, so we had a decision, are we just gonna leave this as its own document um, and attach it and, and save it somewhere? Or um, are we gonna weave this into our existing database system? Or are we even gonna consider a new database system? Um, uh, 
uh, we use uh, a social solutions product called ETO Software. It's a cloud-based online database solution, basically. Uh, we've been using that from 07, uh, since 2007. And uh, we decided to stick with that just, you know, for a number of reasons that I've highlighted here on the slide. Um, you know, we already had it in place. There wasn't a whole data migration that would be needed. It had flexibility uh, within the system to make changes that we might need to make. Um, so we wanted to keep things as consistent as possible for our staff. So uh, there would be, you know, one less thing to change or not change as much. Um, uh, the, the system gives us the ability to reduce data entry errors because um, we have a bunch of data stored uh, on the people that we're, we're working with that we're required to have. Um, and the system, you know, ETO software can communicate with each other and we don't have to put the same piece of information in twice and maybe put it in wrong one time and then we have mismatched information. So and that was another benefit of, of keeping uh, with ETO software and, and again, developing the SIP into it, uh, not just uh, attaching it. Uh, and also uh, we have the ability now to, um, you know, retain a record of our SIP reviews by staff. So every time a new SIP is developed, any team member working with that person, of course, has to be aware of, of the goals on that plan and the PCP document. So we can um, have a place where our staff can go and access online and review the SIP and sign off to acknowledge that they've been trained um, and read that plan. Uh, and then, you know, most importantly, the reason that we really wanted to kind of weave in the SIP into our, our software system was, um, or the software system that we use, excuse me, is um, it's going to directly integrate to the form that staff are using to document what they're doing, what services they're providing. Um, so um, the way we designed it, uh, the, the individualized goals, the outcomes, they're going to show on the screen uh, the screen that staff are using to, to document what's happening each day when they're supporting people. Um, you know, social solutions as a customer of theirs, we get, you know, assigned uh, so, uh, staff support from, from their company so they can help us think through, uh, we, you know, show them where we want to get to, what report we want to end up with, what we need to, our end result will be, and they can help us think through as an organization how are we going to design the form, so to speak? They're called touch points in the system. Um, how are we going to design those touch points to get in all the information we need and communicate within different parts of our database to then spit out the report that we need at the end? Um, so the support available, um, we don't have that in-house. We don't have a dedicated IT professional, so to speak. Um, that's basically outsourced. Um, the Builders Network handles it that way, uh, including with our, our database. and um, so we leaned heavily on them to, to develop our reports and think through how we were going to create the SIP. Um, with our DSAT, uh, or with the DSAT, we took uh, the opposite approach. We basically are just keeping that as the Excel spreadsheet that's provided to us um, as is, and we're adding that as an attachment to our SIP um, once the SIP is completed. So we, we have that DSAT that's attied, uh, attached to it. Um, but there are some additional steps um that we're taking and that are required to um to basically reflect what's on that dsat and ultimately that gets um put into ltss on the pcp and in the form of units per month for each service so um, i think matt touched on a little bit we're wanting to make sure that our database is mirroring what's in ltss as much as possible um as closely as possible so we can really have a good handle on um what services the person is approved for, how many units they have, how many they used. Um, so there is a little bit of, um, uh, of a process in there um, to get those to match one another. We're hoping in the future um, that there can be a little bit more communication between LTSS and various you know, software solutions that providers use. Um, so there's not as much uh, duplicative entry. Um, so, you know, our staff training uh, considerations and approaches uh, and approach surrounding the SIP and the DSAT as we were kind of, these new forms were coming out and new uh, uh, screens were being developed in our database for our staff to use. Um, we had to think about the technical aspects of that. Um, and again, since we stuck with the same software solution we we're using in the past, 
it wasn't a huge jump for people, the technical end, um, as far as to how to navigate the system. Uh, we had to show them what new things were set up. Um, we provided screenshots and a PowerPoint presentation so people would have kind of written materials to refer to afterwards. Um, and we would, we would host uh, Zoom trainings for, for all staff um, that were involved with these you know, requirements, these duties, and <clears throat> were able to kind of go everything, go over everything at once, and then they could walk away with some materials uh, for when they go back to work on it. Um, we also um, have implemented a weekly supervision for um, our direct support staff are going to meet with their program directors weekly um, with the goal of, of meeting for an hour and a half to discuss all things related to their work. But this also for our community support managers who help develop the SIPs and the DSATs, um, this also, also provides an ongoing opportunity to work through challenges they might be having or confusion or technical updates that are made that are minor that maybe a whole other training isn't offered but we want it, we can provide updates weekly uh, as things uh, unfold. Um, one interesting that, thing that came out of this um, that I'll just touch on is philosophically, we, you know, looking closely at the SIP and, and kind of rebuilding it into our system, um, it, it led us to revamping our internal training for uh, how we train our staff to write outcomes and goals. Um, we really look closely at what is the link between the service implementation plan and the PCP document as a whole. And it's it's the outcome description. And that is basically the person that we're all working there to support. How do they describe their outcome? What does it mean to them? Um, uh, how, like, what are they trying to achieve um, in their own words? And so, uh, you know, that was a benefit that came, uh, kind of helped us re-examine our approach to that how we're looking at that and how we're training our staff to, to work with people and the whole team supporting that person um, to really uh, whittle down what is important to the person, how do they describe their outcome. And if that is, if we do a good job of identifying and documenting that, the rest of the PCP document, the SIP, they, they kind of all flow as it I think is intended to be with, with how this PCP in its current state has been developed. Um, so that's kind of just an interesting side thing. I, that I wanted to highlight that kind of came out of us looking at the technical aspect of, of uh, PCP documentation. Um, there we have here one second. I did want to go through, I, I was planning originally um, to go through and show kind of some of the various screens that we go, uh, that our staff go through to create a SIP, but it's, it's pretty scattered and I don't know how much value that would be to this to this group. I think, um, you know, me talking a little bit, sharing some of our considerations and why we went the route we went with this documentation, I think is, is probably hopefully just as helpful. So I mean, I'm, as opposed to sharing that, I'm just gonna share the, um, uh, the next topic I'm gonna talk about. I'll share the screen that we use to document our service delivery. And before I get there, I'll just talk a little bit about what staff are involved and what we do at Abilities Network. Um, our direct support professionals, again, they're a, a community support professional and a community, community support manager, uh, and they're supervised by our program directors. Um, so the CSPs and our CSMs, they're gonna go out and they're gonna provide services. Um, the expectation is that those services are documented within 24 hours. Um, best practice being the day of service delivery. Um, so uh, to help staff meet this expectation, we're gonna have to pay them for their work time and, um, and build that time into their schedule. And uh, so we've we factored in uh, 30 paid minutes, 30 paid minutes uh, each workday for our staff to document the services they provide. And then our PDs, uh, program directors, weekly are reviewing those uh, service logs, so they have an idea of what's going on with people and to be prepared for those those weekly supervisions that we have to, to ask about, you know, what's going on, talk about uh, what services are being used or not utilized, and uh, goal progress, et cetera. Uh, so I do want to jump to the screen um, that we uh, use for our uh, documenting services provided. Here's our um, ETO software uh, 
This is a participant profile. So this is a fake individual that we use for demonstration purposes, Frankie Freak, fake. Um, it is nice for, for new staff to come in uh, when they're, they're doing their training, um, they can get a picture of the person and, and get a visual before they, they meet them. But um, here we have their uh, demographic information and, and we can scroll down and the, the next section is uh, it's what we call our combined effort touch point. Not the best name, but it's basically, it's, it's what we're using to document uh, services provided. Um, so we can go ahead and we would just, uh, staff will come in, they click the plus, plus symbol to take, uh, to record a new uh, touch point. And a service was provided this morning on June 23rd, they would just simply put the date. Uh, our staff, we assign their schedules, we use Microsoft Outlook for that. So um, staff generally know what their schedules are. It's, it's on their Outlook schedule. And we also um, indicate on there which service, if someone has multiple services, um, which service we're providing to that person. Um, in this example, we'll say it was uh, employment services discovery. So we can select the, the funding source. But as you can see here, one person might have multiple different uh, funding services on their PCP. Um, so we have this one form um, where our staff go to and they can select the appropriate service type. Um, then how did that method, uh, how did that service, what, how was it provided? Was it in person? Uh, was it a virtual service, one-to-one -one, or virtual service in a group? If a cancellation happened, we can document that and the reason for. Um, and if it was in person, it's going to give us a reminder um, that we need to do the COVID health inventory and, and indicate that that was completed. Uh, of course, we're going to need to know the time of the service, and we put this in real time. So um, whatever the time was, it might have been 9.02 a.m. to, um, you know, whenever, 10.13. And it'll give us uh, automatically, it'll, it'll tell staff, you know, what the total time is there in case they left the PM. Oh, I wasn't with them for 13 hours. So that's just a helpful, uh, hopefully to reduce some errors. Uh, but I will say the AM and the PM sometimes creates an error. You know, sometimes people miss that uh, or incorrectly select the wrong one. Um, the goals that we've developed on the SIP and documented in our system are going to then be able to populate here on that person's uh, service log. Um, so with the discovery service, they had a goal to complete milestone, milestone one of discovery. Um, it's a goal that's done one time. Um, so uh, they may have started it, but not completed it. So they can uh, indicate that they worked on the goal and they would put goal details to put, uh, put their notes here about how they worked on this goal, what was done specifically um, could go in that box there. If they had another goal that was worked on during this time period, they could kind of just continue to go through and, and document that. Um, if that goal was worked on through a different service, um, as Matt said, you know, a service might stop at one point, and then a new service may start when you're braiding services or stacking services. Um, they might have discovery and then go right into personal supports with us. Um, so we would stop the discovery time and we'd start personal supports time and clock in with EVV and then begin that service. And we would, uh, in that case, for documentation purposes, we would record uh, separate uh, touch points for, for each service provided. So uh, staff would then have a sign off the bottom to say, oh, I hope I didn't lose everybody. Um, Okay. We didn't lose us, but we had trouble seeing your screen for a minute, but it looks like it's back up. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. Um, so I don't know where exactly I lost you guys, but uh, we have the same form basically that staff are going to use um, regardless of what service they provide. So it's just more consistent for staff than having to go different places for different funding or services that they're offering. Um, Staff have the opportunity, opportunity to save something as a draft if they're not finished working on it, or they can save it as a final. Um, and then it it is saved there.
So I, I don't know, you know, how helpful that was, but I, I thought, you know, maybe we could have a little bit of a visual on what our staff see when they're going to fill out uh, their daily service documentation. Um, the review and approval profit process, um, as Matt mentioned, you know, you want to have as, uh, a few different sets of eyes looking on it. The staff who recorded it, then we have the program directors, kind of the first level of review. Um, they're going to be reviewing that weekly. Um, and then uh, the purpose for that is twice per month. Uh, the documentation of service provided, uh, services provided are submitted to the state's database uh, for reimbursement. So we need to make sure that basically all that information is clean, accurate, and ready to go for billing. And that's the PD's main responsibility in reviewing that, uh, or one of their responsibilities, uh, to make sure that all those uh, things are accurate before uh, that billing report is, is pulled. Um, so some of the stuff that our PDs are looking uh, to review, our program directors are making sure that a touch point was entered for the service provided. So they're gonna kind of cross-reference the staff's Outlook calendar, make sure the, the time and date match, the service type is correct. Uh, verify that the goal chosen matches the activity, um verify that the correct service was chosen based on the goal and activity so make sure that the person checked the, the correct funding type uh for for what the goal and activity type indicate uh we want to make sure the notes are providing a concise summary of services provided um and are written objectively without subject subjective information kind of us uh imposing what we think the person feel or how they felt about something uh, we want to make it all as objective as possible and that the time spent seems appropriate based on what was scheduled and what was done. Um, we've also developed some in-house reports um, to get a, a bird's eye view of service utilization for our program directors. They can see, um, we can look at an individual person and all the services they have to see which services they're using and which ones are not. Um, we can also look at it uh, by people served across a region. Um, so uh, those are just different ways we have to look at the data that we're, we're capturing in our IT system. Uh, billing for services rendered, I mentioned before that we're doing manual billing. Um, so twice a month on the 7th, we run a report. Uh, everything will need to be, by that point, uh, for the, the last two weeks of the previous month, needs to be uh, made sure we want to verify that that's accurate and ready for billing. So the program director is going to do that and get it approved by the 7th. Um, and then again, on the 22nd, uh, another report will be run for services rendered between the 1st and the 15th of the current month. Um, we have in, uh, dedicated uh, one of our administrative support um, employees uh, to be a billing specialist as part of their job responsibility. Um, so they're gonna be running, they run these reports and then they do the manual billing in LTSS. Um, some additional staff training and technology uh, considerations, things worth, I think, noting. Um, uh, making sure your, your staff have the equipment to do what's being asked of them. So um, we do provide all of our staff with laptops and iPhones to assist with the completion of job requirements. This helps facilitate communication with their supervisor, as well as the people they support. And, and that um, gives them the ability to um, to get in their documentation in a timely manner. Um, we purposely kept changes to a minimum on the screens that direct support staff use to document the services provided. Um, no one really likes change, so as much as we could keep consistent or familiar to what was, you know, similar to what was done in the past, we, we try to, to keep that. Um, I think offering training materials, including screenshots for direct, direct support staff to refer to after attending training, uh, to introduce change, uh, to introduce those changes, um, it was, was really uh, a critical thing. Not kind of just talking about stuff and and talking over through it once, but making sure staff had some written materials to come away with um, to refer back to when they go to do that uh, particular responsibility. And um, again, uh, just touching on the ongoing weekly supervision and how important that is, just for um, as things change, questions come up. Um, there's an opportunity built in um, 
on a regular basis for staff to get uh, support and get their questions answered. Um, I had a few lessons learned um, as an agency with our, our jump into LTSS last October. Um, <clears throat> you know, the stacking of services or braiding of services um, are, are terms you guys are, everybody's probably hearing. Um, but, uh, you know, realizing that um, once we went into LTSS, we saw the number of services that people had was, you know, they may have had one or two services on their plan in the past, and now they may have five or six services. Um, so making sure that the staff that are going to be working with them understand the differences between the services um, and understanding that people are going to have multiple services on a plan and they might be uh, working on you know, receiving multiple services in a day, either from two different staff or the same staff. Um, <clears throat> And, and getting prepared for or how that's gonna happen. Um, the, I've mentioned this a couple of times already, but the written training materials for staff and ongoing reinforcement, I don't, I don't think I can overemphasize that, um, is, uh, is critical when you're introducing, especially new, uh, you know, detail-oriented things with technology and, and how to, uh, to write a SIP, you know, as much, uh, written and visual you can provide for your staff, I think, uh, the better. And basically allow more time than you anticipate uh, uh, for making the changes into whatever software you're using, um, for preparing your staff uh, to um, be ready to use those changes. Um, you know, things just seem to take longer than we always want to allow ourselves. Um, so just trying to keep that in mind. And, um, uh, Locking of service log notes after 15 days is, is another thing that we have uh, implemented uh, to um, just ensure that once something, you know, we're, we're submitting billing every 15 days. So we want to make sure that after it's uh, something is submitted for billing, there's no way that it's going to change after the fact. Um, so, uh, you know, the ETO software had the ability to. Uh, to lock things for editing after 15 days. So um, you have a kind of a two week window to make sure any corrections are made um, and uh, before it gets submitted for billing. So uh, I know um, that was kind of a lot. I, I um, hope it was, some of that was helpful. Uh, it kind of takes us to our, any questions from the group and I can um, kind of send that back to, to Andrea who, um, or Caroline, if you, if you guys have any questions that have come in, I, I'll do my best to answer those. Thank you, Paul. You're um, yeah, a couple questions. Um, well, first, some folks want to know if you'd be willing to share uh, your PowerPoints. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe the um, there's a handout in, in today's, in the handout section of, of the GoToWebinar today. And um, they, that includes this PowerPoint that I went over today. Great. Um, another question, Paul. Um, someone wants to know uh, how many day individuals do you support? Hmm. Oh, great question. I had that in my notes to mention, and I, I think I skipped over that. Uh, I believe it's uh, over 200. I know. Um, Yeah, um, meaningful day services. Uh, we currently have, we average about 200 manual LTSS entries for each week. Uh, so 200 building entries per week for a manual, uh, for our, uh, meaningful day services. Um, we have 400, over 450 individuals uh, that we provide DDA services to throughout the state of Maryland. Um, um, some of those are support services like uh, personal sports. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, also wants to know um, how many individuals does each um, program director supervise? Uh, that that does vary. Um, I believe uh, the average program director supervises um, five to six staff, and depending on what region that staff works in, 
um, it's it's up to about you know I'd say on average a program director probably oversees about forty to fifty individuals receiving services. Great, and I just got a, a text from from Alan, and and I, I think that number checks out. I think fifty is about the average. Thanks, Paul. Um, so I wanted to um, see if um, if Rhonda Workman would be able to answer a question about um, how are retainer days and COVID shared hours handled in LTSS? Sure, absolutely. Can you hear me, Andrea? I can answer a question. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so somebody is asking, um, how are retainer days and COVID shared hours handled in LTSS? Yeah, th so those are some really good questions. Um, and just a reminder that the DDA has the Appendix K dedicated webpage that has a lot of information about billing and processes and forms. But specific to the additional um, COVID hours, um, we have provided guidance that those hours are supposed to be added to the person's person-centered plan. And then, you know, based as on the current process and standard that if those additional daytime hours are needed, that you would bill them um, only for one person and not for all people in the home um, for those shared hours. And then in terms of retainer and isolation services, those are all billed outside the system using the LTSS billing summary form. This LTSS billing summary form can be found on the DDA's dedicated Appendix K webpage. If you go and scroll to the bottom, you'll see a section called Forms, and that's where that form will be included in addition to instructions and guidance. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, and you had worked in the uh, isolation um, into that question as well. Are there any other questions? Just want to remind everybody that the yes, the the webinar is being recorded, and you'll be able to um, get it off of the DDA website under recorded webinars. And Andrea, I think one just came in uh, that asks how in lieu of day billing is done in LTSS. Rhonda, are you able to answer that question? In lieu of day billing. Um, so again, we need to make sure that we're using the person-centered planning process and noting the services within the person-centered plan. Um, I would also suggest that people um, take a look at the DDA policy related to um, uh, dedicated supports during meaningful day hours. Um, we have a link to our policy um, policy stat on the DDA main page. Um, and so if you click on policy stat, it'll take you to our policies. Um, and we have a um, specific policy related to what we previously referred to as um, in lieu of day. Um, so we refer to this now, the policy is titled residential services using dedicated supports during meaningful day hours. So we've got the policy there, which talks about the options and, and it should be noted within the person-centered plan using that person-centered planning process. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Caroline, you said that you had one more question? Yes, there's one more that came in um, and I'm hoping Rhonda will be able to answer it. It's, is there a way to take someone who is in LTSS with at least 30 dedicated hours and add 10 for one person in the home. So again, you want to use the person-centered planning process, um, look at the person's needs, um, and if the person needs dedicated one-to-one -one supports for 
feeding because of a nursing care plan, because of a behavior plan, um, or if they need two to one supports, um, you would want to put that into their person center plan um, with the supporting documentation for that. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Andrea, um, I just wanted to mention um, just some feedback that was also um, typed in um, that going back to um, the slides, um, just some feedback, Paul, that um, they're very, very good and effective, easy to understand, um, overall very helpful. Oh, okay, thank you for sharing that feedback. I was, <laughs> obviously that was our intent, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that they were helpful. Or, All right. If anybody has anything else to say, jump in. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll turn it back over to Caroline. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you to Paul and Matt today for their presentation and sharing this important information. This concludes our third session of our LTSF Maryland Lunch and Learn series. On behalf of the Developmental Disabilities Administration, we thank you for your participation and hope you're able to join us for our next session on July 7th at 12 p.m. Thank you all and have a wonderful day. Thank you, bye-bye.